From Isaiah 58, we start at the words, Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? The Lord was asking a question to those who were fasting and says, God, you know, what's the issue there? We've been fasting and we're trying to get some ends. And God said, is it not to share your bread with the hungry? And I want to talk about that today. I want to talk about terms of spiritual disciplines. And normally when we talk about spiritual disciplines, we go, mm-mm, furrowed brow, what do you mean? I'm doing so much already. Uh, we feel uh, imposed on and sometimes a tinge of guilt. If I ask the show of hands, when I talk about spiritual disciplines, then you say, what do you mean? Well, I can talk about prayer, a life given to prayer. What about Bible reading? What about Bible memorization? I said to somebody, I quoted some scripture, and he said, ah, Psalm 139. Are we on the ball that we know the word of God familiar? What about meditation? Oh, I've had a busy week. I haven't even been able to think about it. But it's the quiet stillness, and that's where solitude and silence come into it, one of the spiritual disciplines. There are spiritual disciplines of generosity, of fellowship, of simplicity, a spiritual discipline of celebration. But the last at the bottom of the list is usually fasting. When you, what I mean by fasting is going for a one meal, missing a meal, missing two meals, going for a 24-hour period that you devote between you and God to pray and to humble yourself before God. Fasting is probably one of the most psychologically challenging spiritual disciplines. And I think a lot of us shy away from it and only use it as a, as a last triple zero, nine one one kind of emergency kind of backstop in our lives. Because um, no matter what our age is, our inclination or our personality, um, it's one of the biggest psychological dis- challenges that we face. And I want to explore the subject of fasting and open it up a little bit so that it isn't as a discipline like, oh dear, yeah, I know I haven't, I just, you know. Um, because, you know, somebody in the Eastern States passed me a comment just recently and said, John, in the, many years ago, many years ago, the church used to fast. We used to proclaim a fast across the land. And I can show you biblical examples where there was a fast that was proclaimed. And why don't we do it now? And I've always thought, well, fasting is just between you and God. You don't want to do it publicly. Um, Others say, well, I fast every Sabbath. And others say, well, I love Sabbath rest and fellowship and I don't want to be burdened by a strong headache and a feeling of just being wasted completely. And so you have all these conversations that come up. So I want to talk about what is fasting, why fast, what does the scripture teach, and how do I navigate this discipline? Well, let's, let's build with a few scriptures because our, the Holy Bible is God's word. It's divinely delivered by God using human instruments. And in Matthew chapter 9, if you've got your Bible there, beginning in verse 14, the disciples of John came to Jesus and said, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, in verse 14, but your disciples do not fast? In other words, it's, scripture elsewhere says John didn't come eating and John didn't eat and drink. And the, and the religious leader says, ah, he has a demon. And Jesus came eating and drinking and they said, ah, gluttons and, and a mixer with sinners. So John's disciples could see that Jesus' disciples didn't fast. Verse 15, and Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? Like the Son of God and the Son of Man was in their presence. Rejoice! The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast. So when you see the bridegroom, Jesus, with nails in his hands and a spear thrust into his side, and he crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then probably you don't feel like lunch that day. You're going to sort of (laughs) struggle with that. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 6. Is fasting optional? What does Jesus say? Matthew 6 verse 16, and when you fast... Not if you fast, when you fast. Now that's a decision between you and you alone and God. No one predicates that. Do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces and that their fasting may be seen by others. So you, I could come along and walk really limpy and he say, what's wrong, John? He says, oh, I'm fasting today. And so I banner my little righteous, self-righteous badge before men. That's what Jesus was saying. He said, truly I say to you, they've received their ward. You know, the Pharisees used to, according to Scripture, say they fasted twice a week. 
Whatever that meant. Did they do two consecutive days? Or did they fast on a Monday and a Thursday? I don't know, but they, they fasted twice a week in many cases. But when you fast, in verse 17, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others. So you dress up and you look sharp, and, but your father who sees in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. That's very, something very powerful and very encouraging that you, what you do is between you and your heavenly father. And God hears those people who fast and pray that mountains can be moved in a very powerful way. Now, let's go back to Isaiah 58. We mentioned that um, in passing in conversation this morning. And it's a very powerful chapter and it strikes at the heart of what's happening in your heart when you come before God and you need an answer and you need to know that you... If, you know, sometimes when you... We read the scripture from Deuteronomy... What chapter was it this morning? I'm sorry. When you, you're rich and prospered and you begin to forget God and you sort of say, well... I've done all this. This is Australia. We've lost our Judaic Christian ethos. We actually believe that we are great and mighty and powerful because of providence of, or accident or, or sheer luck or, or great science. No. God blessed us. He prospered us. He brought us into this land. Anyway, let's read this. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 1. Cry aloud, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet and de declare to my people their transgression. A transgression is a bad relationship between people. To the house of Jacob, their sins when you sin against God. And then God makes it very interesting because they, the, the, the society looked okay as if they were good with God. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways, says the Lord, as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. So every Sabbath they gather together. They sang songs. They, they look great as a church or as a congregation. Verse 3, they ask a question. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Do you remember Elijah and the prophets of Baal? And they were dancing before Baal and cutting themselves and creating a great thing, you know, they're wanting the deity on their behalf to act and Baal and, and, and Elijah mocks them. So these are people who are coming before God and saying, God, you're not listening to me. Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. So your life is way off key, says God. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. So on the outside you look okay, but inside you are not godly. Fasting like this, yours like this day, will not make your voice to be heard on high. So part of fasting is to say, God, I trust you, I rely on you, I love you, help me to live a righteous life. Hear my prayer, because I depend on the bread of life, Jesus. You know, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So some of our prayer and our day of dedication of fasting is to say, God, I have nothing. I haven't drank water for a few hours now. I haven't eaten the, my breakfast and lunch, and it's coming on to dinner, and I'm really starting to feel messed around. My mind is foggy, my body is weak. Father, I know you hear our prayers. Help me to be righteous and holy and true. Forgive me of my sins, etc. In verse 5, Is this such the fast that I choose, says the Lord, a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed, to spread a sackcloth of ashes under him? So that's what the Pharisees used to do, or the religious hypocrites that Jesus referred to. Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? So all this outward tipping ashes on your head, and lying prostrate on the ground. Like, your life doesn't match that humility. Verse 6, Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? What's holding you back in your relationships? Declare to my people their transgression. A transgression is when you wrong the person next to you or in your society. Verse 7 is very powerful. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless into your poor, into your, the homeless poor into your house? And when you see him naked, to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Do you remember Matthew chapter 25? The king who... Let me, hold your thumb there. We're going to come back to, to, to Isaiah. Hold your thumb there and turn to Matthew 25 verse 31. 
This is exactly what Jesus is speaking about, about fasting. Because when you fast and you miss a meal, do you take the $25 and give it to somebody less fortunate than yourself? This is the spirit of fasting that God is saying. Matthew 25, beginning in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and brothers and sisters, we are waiting for that, he will sit on his glory, his throne, and before him he will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Now we're all familiar with this. And he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. And the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked, I didn't have enough clothes. And you went down to St. Vincent de Paul and you got some clothes for me. Or you took your shirt off your own back to give it to me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you and thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you and naked or clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison? You're the king. And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Our transgressions among the brotherhood of believers is an egregious sin in the eyes of the Lord. And so when Saul was caught on the road to Damascus, the Lord says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Because Saul was persecuting the body of Christ and Christ was feeling the pain. Let's go back to Isaiah. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? That's a different spirit when you fast. That your denial, whoever would come after me, let him deny himself, says Jesus, pick up his cross and follow me, that your denial of your own comfort reaches out to help somebody less fortunate. Verse 8, then your light shall break forth like the dawn. In other words, you've been in darkness and struggling. And your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Now that is a powerful promise in regard to fasting. Then you shall cry, then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, and the pointing of the finger, and the speaking of wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry, and satisfy the desire of the afflicted. That's the spirit of Matthew 25. I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. This is what God is telling Isaiah. Tell my people their transgression. And of course their transgression led to alienation from God, which is sin. And then your light shall arise in the darkness, and your gloom be as a noonday. That's why God wants us to fast. It's, it's, you could say God was hating the fasting. He was, because the spirit of transgression was woven into their very lives. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, a spring of water whose waters fail not. All of us at a certain level can relate to that and think, ah, I'm beginning to understand what this mind of God in other words, you, when you fast, you totally humble yourself to go to your brother, to make things right in your relationships, and then you come and offer your or gift on the altar, so to speak, to use biblical language. You know, one thing about fasting, in the, under the terms of the Old Covenant, the high priest did everything, and people relied on the high priest for their life, for their salvation, for their righteousness and their forgiveness. You know, having a sandwich during the day wasn't going to help. It only give you a wrong sense of self-sufficiency. I feel great. I remember when I was 34, I flexed my sun tan body before my wife and I said, I'm the fittest I've ever been. Boastful, in a sense. And I was. I didn't realise by the time I got to 35, I was the sickest I was ever been. <laughs> Words come back to bite us. But the idea of being willing to deny yourself for a period of time in a world of distraction to humble before God. And um, I want to give an example where you can change the course of history. Esther was in a precarious situation. The king hadn't called her for 30 days 
if she appeared like, and I don't understand society then, if she, if she came to him without his royal scepter, she would be immediately sa- killed. And, and if she was in a situation of threatened ge- genocide where a political power, through malevolence in the politics, had created an irreversible rule to kill all the Jews in Sushan, in that particular area. Turn to Esther chapter 4. She was born for such a time as this, and Mordecai warns her that if you don't do it, somebody else will stand in that place. Perhaps you are born for such a time. Esther chapter 4, verse 15. Then Esther told them, told them to reply to Mordecai, because when you know that all your family and all your friends and all your tribe is going to be wiped out, you know the devil's in the detail. Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days, day or night. Now I know a young man that I know and I love the guy who said, John, I tried to fast for three days. By the second day I was a wreck. By the third day, he said, I couldn't do it. It just killed me. Now, there's no way that you can say, okay, we have enough Jews in there, let's get some swords and some spears and we'll fight back. What you're doing is saying, God, I'm going to trust you on this and I'm going to show you my trust. None of us are going to eat or drink. Now, the human body can live, depending on your body mass, I've been reading about this week, can live between three or eight days without water. If you're a rather big person, you're carrying a lot more water, you can last up to eight days. If you're a very slender person, after the third day, you can start suffering body um, organ failure. So it's a pretty risky type of thing where you're going to tell people across the nation to fast. Um, you can go up for up to 40 days and without... Um, the average person can last about 40 days. There was a one man who went 86 days and there was another man who was 220 pounds, went to a hospital and never ate um, for... I can't remember how long and he got down to 81 kilos. From 220 kilos down to 81 kilos. And then he, after, he, was, uh, he was fasting for 382 days, which is more than a year. Um, and it just showed him he was holding his trousers out like that because he was a very, very big man. But Esther was saying for everybody, in normal conditions, three days and three nights, you are really saying, God, I trust you, and I'm not going to rely on my own strength. I and my young woman will also fast as you do. So she's not telling the nation to do that. She's saying, I'm going to do it as well. Then I will go to the king, though it's against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything that Esther had ordered him. You know, Esther is very powerful. You know, Purim is celebrated every year where the Jews were given victory and they were allowed to equip and God gave them victory. And but when you fast for three days and three nights, you have no physical strength. Now, we are told that in difficult circumstances, don't have anxiety. Now, if I was going to see my family and my friends and my nation wiped out, I would have some anxiety. So... Philippians chapter 4, I recite this verse to myself, I think every day, from chapter verse 4. The Lord is at hand, the last part of verse 5. Do not be anxious about anything. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So don't be anxious, but come to God in prayer and supplication. Supplication is really pleading prayer. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I want to take you to the book of Ezra, Ezra chapter 8. There was a difficult situation. There was reason for anxiety. Ezra was travelling from Babylon. He had gold and silver from from the king's decree to go to Jerusalem. And so Ezra was on a mission. He had a lot of responsibility. Ezra chapter 8, verse 21. Then I proclaimed a fast there. So, okay, that's very interesting. Why did he proclaim a fast? At the river Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before God to seek from him a safe journey for ourselves, our children and all our goods. So when Jesus told the parable, a man went from Jerusalem to Jericho, everybody went, whoa, nobody travels that road alone. It's full of bandits and robbers. And so he knew the land between Babylon and Jerusalem. 
For I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers, in verse 22, and horsemen to protect us against the enemy on our way, since we had told the king, the hand of our God is for good on all who seek him, and the power of his wrath is against those who forsake him. So the idea was, the king had given them gold and silver and riches and a great long letter of approval, but he was too afraid to ask for some soldiers to protect them. So we fasted and implored our God for this. Please, God, protect us, us and our children. And he listened to our entreaty. And I'm going, wow. So there's an example, a noble example of fasting. You're stepping out in faith and you are travelling along the wilderness journey where you, all, you could be robbed and your bodies would lie in the sand and all the gold and silver stolen, you and your children. And Ezra said, well, I've told the king that God is mighty. So he fasted and God heard them. So there's a reason you might be facing a difficult situation and you need to know that, God, I go by strength. Your strength, your spirit. I'll give you a, a couple of examples of fasting from Scripture as well. There was a, a woman called Anna and she was of the tribe of Asher. She had been, she, her husband died after they were married seven years and she was 84 years old now that she was in the temple. In verse 37 of Luke 2, she did not depart from the temple, worshipping with fasting and prayer day and night. So everybody who said, oh, Anna, oh, she's the 84-year-old who's praying and fasting in the temple. And she was part of the narrative of introducing Jesus to the world. I know when you're 84, from those I've known, fasting is very difficult. My grandmother struggled with fasting. Um, sometimes fasting is very important. In the lead up in providing the, the, the journey of forming the Australia National Council, I'm encouraging all participants to spend some time in spiritual discipline, as I have done, um, to make a wise decision. A spirit-led, Christ-centred, godly decision that will have good reverberations for the Church of God Seventh Day in Australia. Acts 13, 2-3 speaks into this. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. So they were looking for affirmation, ordination, the work of the Spirit. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. I was very encouraged. Several of those we asked to participate in the National Council said, John, thank you. I, I accept to be nominated. Sorry, I will not accept nomination until I've had time with God. I need to think and pray about it. And a week later, a phone call would come saying, yes, um, I'll take the position. I'm very humble to serve on that. It reminds me of this, you know, the ordination or the sanctification or the setting aside for service. Ministry means service in those significant decisions we have to make. In Acts 14, the next chapter in verse 23, this is one of the things that we want to replicate in Australia, is to appoint elders in every church. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord whom they believed. So under the terms of the New Covenant, in the first century church, fasting was a part of making wise decisions in the context of church life. And so if you put the mantle on for church leadership, certain disciplines are non-negotiable. To humble yourselves before God, to make a decision. Now I want to take some extreme versions of fasting, 40 days and 40 nights, because we've got questions about that. Moses fasted, Elijah fasted, Jesus fasted. They're the three people who fasted for 40 days. Now, Deuteronomy 9, Mo Moses recounts, and he mentions the time he fasted. Verse 9, when I went up in the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant that the Lord had made with you, I remained on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water. And the medical students among us would say, ha, 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 you can't live 40 days without water. You might get three days, you might get seven days, you might just get eight days. But you're going to have organ failure. How do we answer this? I'm going to come to the answer in a moment. Deuteronomy 9, verse 18. Then Moses recounts the second time he went up to get the second lot of the Ten Commandments. Remember he came down from the mountain and they were worshipping a golden calf and in his anger he threw the stones down on the ground and they broke. Deuteronomy 9, 18. Then I lay prostrate before the Lord as before. 
Wow, what is it to lay prostrate before the Lord? It's not just standing, bowing your head. It's not just gently kneeling on the ground. You're lying on the ground with face on the ground. I neither ate bread nor drank water. So he fasts a second time for 40 days and 40 nights. Because of all the sin that had committed in doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Now very few people will fast for 40 days and 40 nights because of other people's sins. It puts Moses at an elevation that I don't think we fully understand. You know. In other words, to go without water for 40 days is humanly impossible, given where we are today. And that was a question I asked my dad as a boy. Was there divine or angelic ministry? Well, in Moses' case, there wasn't. But in Elijah's case, yes. And in Jesus' case, yes. Elijah was in perilous times. King Ahab was married to a Sidonian, I think Sidonian woman, Jezebel. She was a nasty piece of work. At least you could talk to Ahab, but Jezebel was a nasty piece. So Jezebel sent a message to Elijah in 1 Kings 12, 19 verse 2. So that the gods may do to me and also if I do not make your life as one of them by this time tomorrow. She had killed all the prophets. Now Obadiah had taken a hundred prophets, hidden them in a cave in the mountains and fed them bread and water. And you can see where Elijah and Obadiah interact later on in the story. But, um, and, <laughs> I have, sorry, Jared, Elijah was afraid. From the high moments of his life, he was now running for his life. Because he said, God, they've killed all the prophets and now they're going to slay me. And he went a day's journey in verse 4 and came to the wilderness and he sat down under a broom tree like, okay, I'm like Jonah at the moment. I just want to die. And he asked that he might die saying, it is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life so I'm no better than my father's. I've run out of arrows. I have no more cards up my sleeve. I don't know what's going to happen. And he lay down and slept in verse 5 under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him. Oh, so there is a miraculous part of this. And said to him, arise and eat. And he looked and behold, there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. So the angel had provided him some sustenance. And the angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him and said, arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank. He's eating food that was divinely provided for him by an angel. And went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. So he spent the next 40 days and 40 nights walking the great across of the wilderness to go to Horeb, which is Mount Sinai. An angel ministered to Elijah and the food that he ate on those two meals was enough to last him 40 days and 40 nights until he got to Mount Sinai Horeb and he goes and hides in a cave and the God says, Elijah, what are you doing here? Now, I don't recommend you try to fast for 40 days or 40 nights. Don't Don't try to be a Moses or an Elijah or, you know, when Jesus fasted on the Mount of Temptation, when he finished, you know, he fasted and the angel came when he was at the weakest. Now, I might be weak after one day or two days or whatever, three days, whatever, but after 40 days, you have no strength. And not only don't you have strength, your mind is very foggy. Very, you can't make decisions, you can barely talk. And so that's when the devil comes, when you're at your weakest. Now, what happens at the end? After the devil leaves him, because the devil tempts him three times, angels came and ministered to him. So there was angelic ministry in Jesus' life. Very powerful. Very powerful. It's a, it's, most people will miss a meal and then they might have lunch or they might miss lunch and have miss a meal, especially if you're elderly. Um, you know, the idea that Jesus authentically fasted, you could say, well, he was the son of God and the son of man. He was full of the Holy Spirit. He had divine power and he probably could have done it because he was the son of God. But then if you, if you speak, you deny he's son of man, he's hu- fully human. Because if he wasn't fully the son of man, fully human, then you could also deny his crucifixion as having validity. He just went through a, a show. He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or it is finished. Just to show us physically that he was dying. And in fact it was, no, he suffered and died because he took on our sin. 
and, the, and otherwise his crucifixion, death and resurrection would not be authentic. I want to finish up now on when and how and where we should fast in the terms of the new covenant living in 2024. First of all, it's between you and God alone. And it's not just one spiritual discipline, it's part of a bigger spiritual discipline, prayer, um, scripture reading, scripture medita uh, meditation on the scripture, biblical text memorization, etc. Um, solitude and silence. In a busy world, that's one of the hardest things we have to do. If you live in the country or you live remotely, that's a lot easier. You can sit on a veranda at night and go, oh Lord, how I love your Lord. He's ever with me. But sometimes we hit our head on the pillow running at night and still can't get to sleep. What about acts of charity? I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was naked, clothed me. When I visit my dad, this afternoon we're going to leave here and most of us are actually going out to Fremantle Hospital to visit with my dad. He's really looking forward to it in his, in his, in his sickness, in his, in his age. I want to recommend some healthy recommendations that fasting is not optional and there are times in your life or seasons in your life. It's not whether you do it every week or not, I don't know. That's between you and God alone. It might be once a year, it might be once every three years. Between you and God, only do it as it's healthy for your body. Some people elderly can only fast by missing one meal and that's enough for them. Others fast all day, but they hydrate with water. Others can fast for three days, or we have some friends in the Eastern States, they do seven days every couple of years. Others cannot fast, but might ask others to fast on their behalf. Have you ever thought of that? It's very powerful. So brothers and sisters, I did not name this sermon Fasting Spiritual Discipline because immediately it would have a negative impact. And I took the words from Isaiah, is it not to share your bread with the hungry? The spirit of breaking what's transgression and living the life that Christ has for us, as told in parable, as expounded in Isaiah 58, and is reaching our hearts and minds today, so that we can be those people, as Jesus said, who can say to a mountain, move, and that mountain is moved. And I really appreciate your attention today and I look forward to our fellowship as we continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus. Mm -hmm.